We've come now to the end of Matthew 27. I'd like for you to take the Word of God and open it, if you would, to the book of Matthew. And we are nearing the end of this long project of studying our way through this book, and I've so thoroughly enjoyed it. We're so near to the end. But it's been, it's been a blessing. Probably very, there's very little that's changed my life to the extent that this study has. And the words of Christ and what they mean for us today and what they mean to me uh, as, a, as a Christian has been very uh, impactful. Our text is Matthew 27, verses 54 through 66. And we're going to look at the responses of different people to the death of Jesus Christ. And there's much to be said here about the burial, uh, but all of these different people are responding to the reality that Christ has died. Something that's very interesting is that during the crucifixion of Jesus, there, there's no uh, miracle that Jesus performs. There are certainly miraculous things happening, but through his trial, he's not performing miracles after he heals Malchus's ear. He is basically silent and patient and waiting and quiet and meek and mild and harmless as a lamb. And until his resurrection, he's not doing anything except for uh, having the will of wicked men imposed upon him. Here's your bullet point. Like the Old Testament stories of Esther, Joseph, or Ruth, we can see the working of of the invisible God in mighty ways in Christ's death and burial. Even though there aren't miraculous things being done by the hand of Jesus Christ, there are still miracles taking place. At this time, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the next great miracle on God's table, a timetable, but we still see in our text, we see hardened souls being converted, 700-year-old prophecies being fulfilled, Jesus' own predictions coming true because of laws that God gave over 1,400 years earlier and other things like that. So it's fascinating that we have a God who is sufficient for all of these things, and although Jesus is not personally performing observable supernatural miracles, we still see miraculous things happening just in the fact that God's providential hand is overseeing all of the details, and he is bringing the end to pass just as he declared from the beginning. And who is sufficient to all of these things? Only God. Only our God. Let's read our text, Matthew 27, verses 54 through 66. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so that the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone, and setting a watch. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. 
Father, please bless us now as we study your word and bring truth home to our hearts to make a difference. May we leave here tonight more persuaded to trust you, to love you, to honor you, to glorify you, to serve you, to praise you. May our relationship to you be helped and blessed because of the things we see and hear and read tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one is the soldiers. These are the different people who react to the death of Christ. Verse 54, we see the soldiers, and it's a surprising turn of events. The battle-hardened soldiers admit the truth of what the religious rulers had been claiming about Jesus and mocking him. Here's your first bullet point under number one. A centurion was a man who oversaw 100 soldiers. And the Bible speaks about him and the others who were with him, and it was probably three men. I think we saw that they divided his coat into four parts. They uh, tried to give something equal to every person, and, and so we would say that there's the centurion and maybe three or possibly four others with him. And uh, the Bible says that they had great fear because of the earthquake and seeing the things that were done. Now, go uh, flip over to Luke 23, if you would, really quick. I want you to see this verse. Because, because some people say, well, this is everyone that was there. And uh, I, I think there's a, a different reaction in the centurion and the soldiers from the rest of the people in the crowd. And, um, and, and the Bible, I think, makes this distinction. And it is important because there can be a, a sort of fearfulness that does not result in true repentance, a true acknowledging of the truth, a true turning to Christ. There can be a certain fearfulness that on the last day, the Lord will say, whosoever is fearful shall have his part in the lake of fire that burns, uh, or in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. In Luke 23, verse 48, it says, and all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. Now, that's really different from the verse right before it. Verse 47, speaking about the centurion, it says, Now, when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And you'll find that bullet point in your, in your notes in verse 47. The blank is the word God. And this is the Holy Spirit's commentary by Luke that the centurion glorified God. The centurion admitted that Jesus was righteous. The crowd was troubled. They were fearful at the earthquake, the darkness, and the other things. They beat their chests, and then they returned. Here's your bullet point. The centurion gave glory to God, declared the righteousness of Christ, and recognized his divinity. Truly, this was the Son of God. And the blank is Son, and it's capital S. In, uh, in the scripture, and so you'll want to write it that way, S-O-N. And a lot of modern scholars will tell us, and not all modern scholarship is bad, there's plenty of good, but a lot of modern scholars will tell us that he was a pagan Roman, he was probably from Rome, he knew nothing about a Jewish Messiah, he knew nothing about the prophecies, he knew nothing about John 3.16, and a lot of that is very, very true. I'm sure that's true. Here's your bullet point, though. I want you to recognize um, while the soldiers were pagan Romans who knew little about the Jewish religion, here's some things to consider. They might have heard Jesus' interactions with Pilate, with the crowd, with the thieves, and with his father. They probably had conversations with the Jewish rulers who came out, and certainly the soldiers heard them mocking and that's the blank. Because while modern scholarship says, well, he was not glorifying God, Luke disagrees. Not you. The other one. I'm sure you disagree too, but uh, the other Luke, the Luke in Scripture, he says, this was a righteous man. This was the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit says, he glorified God. It's an amazing thing that's happening here. They'd been made to make a sign that said, this is the king of the Jews. They'd heard enough, at least, to make a choice. Here's your bullet point. Truly, Matthew records him saying, truly. That's very important in this context. 
They were saying that what they had heard was true. They're agreeing to something. They're affirming something. So certainly they were pagans, but we all were at one point, right? Every one of us heard the gospel at one time. They may have walked into Jerusalem just that morning. They may have been completely ignorant about all of the things, all of the prophecies of Messiah and all of the fulfillment of Scripture, all of those things. But they were agreeing with the truth that they had heard. They were choosing sides, and the side that they chose was Jesus. They had heard that he was the Son of God, and they said, truly, he was. And they may have heard it from his adversaries. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be equal with God, and they said, truly, he was. You don't have to go to seminary to understand the gospel, right? And in fact, a person could understand the gospel in just several minutes. And what an afternoon this must have been for these men. Can you imagine the things that they heard and the things that they saw? It was certainly enough for this man and those that are with him to look up and say, truly, this man was the son of God. Truly, this man was was a righteous man. And God's gracious to pagan sinners who understand the gospel and pick sides. And these guys took a side and they glorified God. Number two, the women. The women were there. There were many female disciples who loved and served Jesus. Matthew only mentions three by name, but he mentions them in a way that elevated their dignity in a society that generally would view women as insignificant or as property. Here's your bullet point. Matthew mentions three women specifically. There's Mary Magdalene, and, and her name is Mary of Magdala. That's not a, a surname. That, that's a city name. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome. And I'll tell you how to spell that. S-A-L-O-M-E. This is the mother of Zebedee's children, of James and John. And we know Salome's name because Mark 15, verse 40 tells us. Now, in John chapter 19, verse 26, we read that John was there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. But Matthew's not giving us an exhaustive list. He says that many women mourned at a distance. And he seems most concerned with telling us the names of a few women and what they were known for. These women had followed Jesus for a long time. When Matthew says that they followed from Galilee, he was not speaking about geography. He was speaking about timing. They'd followed him from his ministry in Galilee. Here's your bullet point. These women began following Jesus, not recently, but in Galilee. These aren't Johnny come lately. These are folks who had been serving Jesus. And we know Salome, we know Mary Magdalene, we know the other Mary, we know that his own mother served him, we know Joanna served him, we know Susanna served him. There were a lot of women who loved and served Jesus. And according to Matthew, there were many who were mourning him. Here's your bullet point. They used hospitality, generosity, finances, and or talents, and other resources. They wanted to help Jesus accomplish his mission. They believed in him. They loved him. It grieved them to see him suffer. Mary Magdalene would be unmarried, which is why she was known by the name of her city, not by the name of her husband. She's Mary of Magdala. The second Mary that Matthew mentions, if you notice, she's known not by her husband, but by her children, and the third woman, Salome, is identified not even by her name, but by her husband, which would have been enough at the time uh, for them to know who she was, Zebedee and Zebedee's children. They were pretty well known. They were uh, pr pretty famous, or maybe infamous in some, some circle circles. Here's your bullet point. These women were not respected members of first century Jewish society, or first century Roman society for the simple fact that they were what? Women. <laughs> Women were not, I mean, their testimony was not admissible in court. They weren't looked on as being credible witnesses. They weren't looked on as being very useful outside of 
often the, the desires of the men in their lives. But Matthew points a, fa- a fact out to us that's really important. Here's your bullet point. They were credible and trustworthy eyewitnesses to the crucifixion of Jesus. They were credible witnesses. They were to be believed. Matthew's saying, here are the people that were there. If you want to verify the statements that I'm saying, here are the ones who were there. And if you look down uh, in verse 61, he was buried. Do you, do you want to know that he was buried? Do you want to know that it was true? These women, you can ask them. Go to the women and ask them. Interesting. They were credible. You could trust them. Not only could they be believed, but they were honest. They were eyewitnesses. They saw it. He also shows their bravery. When 10 of the disciples were hiding, quote, unquote, for fear of the Jews, here are these women, many women, making it to watch the cross. They stood with their Savior to the very end. G. Campbell Morgan said like this, and I think it's very beautiful. He said, quote, these women were hopeless, disappointed, bereaved, heartbroken, but the love he had created in those hearts for himself could not be quenched, even by his dying could not be overcome even by their disappointment, could not be extinguished even though the light of hope had gone out and over the sea of their sorrow there was no sighing wind that told of the dawn, end quote. But the dawn was coming. But still, with more questions than hope, they watched Jesus die. They followed him to where he was buried. They watched the stone put over the grave. This exemplifies faithful commitment to the Savior. They sought to continue their ministry to Jesus even after his death. Number three, let's look at Joseph. Verses 57 through 60. This scene occurs to when the evening had come. Here's your first bullet point. The even, E-V-E-N, the even refers to the time between Jesus' death at 3 p.m. and the day's end at 6 p.m. This was important because the Jewish rulers would not have wanted the body to remain hanging there after 6 p.m. because the next day was the Sabbath. The next day was the Jewish Sabbath. Moses had commanded this. It's in your notes, Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 through 23. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now, I'm I'm not going to go deeply into this. I didn't prepare to go into it, but just to say those people who want to bicker over what day of the week it is, was are are pretty foolish and we should not uh, stoop ourselves we should not stoop ourselves there is a good case to be made for friday there is a good case to be made for thursday there's a uh, case to be made for wednesday i don't know how i've tried to wrap my head around it and i just say okay But you notice what the Lord says 1,400 years before this to Moses. If a man is put to death and hung upon a tree, do not let his body remain all night upon the tree. Bury him that day. Now, this would create an issue. It's 3 o'clock, it's 4 o'clock, it's 5 o'clock. He can't hang there. Tomorrow's the Sabbath, and more than the Sabbath, it's the Passover for us. He cannot hang there. So here's what we have to do. We have to go by and break his legs. Now, the great historian, Alfred Edersheim, and I say great and I mean it. So you young men and some of you not so young men, Alfred Edersheim is a blessing. If you ever want to do some reading on the temple or on some Old Testament stuff, he's just top notch but he records in great detail the roman soldier practice of breaking the legs of people who were crucified 
and they would expire quickly once their legs were broken because the only way they could breathe was to pick their bodies up to get pressure off of their lungs and otherwise the lungs would fill with blood quickly and they would drown and so generally suffocation was the way that people would die from hanging and so the soldiers were going to come by and break the legs and then after the legs were broken they had a practice called the death stroke where they would take a spear and thrust it into the side of a person to verify that they were completely dead go to psalm 34 if you would really quickly now because of what moses had said or what god had said through moses don't let his body hang on the tree all night the soldiers were going to come by and break his legs but the scripture had prophesied something in psalm 34 verse 20 about the messiah he keepeth all his bones not one of them is broken and they come by and they see that he's dead and many people would say that out of rage or anger the guard thrust the spear because uh, he didn't get to break his legs and he was hoping to I don't read it that way I don't sense that that kind of information is given to us but even though it was by all rights it was apparent he was dead they still did the death stroke which is interesting because it also fulfills Zechariah 10 verse 12 which says and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced but they did not need to break his legs and so everything happened exactly right on time and so what luck huh no <laughs> But here's what, what this means, is that after Jesus' death, the evening is coming. He's apparently dead, but they don't have a lot of time to put him in the tomb. If the Sabbath begins at 6 p.m., which it does, then everybody needs to be home with all of their work done by 6 p.m. And so there's only a few hours to prepare. But by God's grace... There was a rich man named Joseph who just happened to be there. He was on hand to serve the Lord, to serve Christ, and also to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 53. Here's what we know of Joseph. And in your, in your notes, I have several things I've given to you. Firstly, he was from the city of Arimathea. There's very little we know about this city outside of the word of God, and, and Luke 23, verse 51 calls it a city of the Jews. He was from Arimathea, which was a city of the Jews, probably near Jerusalem. Um, a lot of Bible scholars, Bible students have noticed that there is a city uh, called Rama, which could very well, and it was the city that Samuel was from, the city of Rama, and it's near to Jerusalem, and it very well could have become known as Arimathea by then, but we don't have any record of it outside of the Scripture. As far as I know, I couldn't find anything uh, other than that. Secondly, he was rich. And as you know, God often bestows wealth upon his children, and whenever that occurs, God has a purpose for it. There is a purpose for all of our wealth and for all of our lack thereof, here's your bullet point. Joseph had done some preparations for his own passing, which was wise, um, and he had enough money to give away his brand new tomb. Now, the scriptures say he, and I think it's in Matthew, yeah, verse, verse 60. He laid the body of Jesus in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. So this did not exist before he uh, um, commissioned it to be done. He'd paid to have it hewn out of the rock himself. But now he saw a greater use for it, a more urgent use for sure. Now, it's impossible to say if it was his wealth or if it was some other influence, but I, I tend to think it was his wealth. Uh, he gets into Pilate, and he asks to have the body of Jesus in order to bury it. Here's your next sub point. The word for to be delivered in Matthew 27, verse 58, indicates that some money changed hands. 
that there was a financial agreement here. There was a financial arrangement for it. Often, Roman soldiers would take um, bodies of their victims and they would further abuse them after their death. And it was not uncommon for bodies to be hung, bodies to be lit and used for torches even after their, their passing. And it was a signal to everyone of what happened if you crossed Rome. Don't cross Rome. Don't get in the way of Rome. And so it was often that these bodies were uh, abused. And Pilate owes nothing to Joseph. But notice in Mark 15, 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And the wording is very, is very interesting. Verse 58 of our text, he begged the body. Uh, Mark 15, he craved the body. But he went in boldly. And he arranged to have it delivered. Uh, and so he had some, some form of influence, at least. He had some form of wealth. And there is more to it than his wealth, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, I can imagine Pilate is wanting to appease both sides. I think the Jewish rulers would have loved to seen the, the body of Jesus abused more. But he also understood that there were a lot of people shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, not a week earlier. So he has to appease both sides. And so he gives him the body, uh, allows him to take it. Joseph takes the body. He wraps it in a clean linen cloth. He places it in the tomb, which he had carved out of the rock. He rolled a great stone over the door of the sepulcher. And thinking through it, we ought to recognize that Joseph does not do all of this stuff himself. The Bible says he does. The Bible says he rolled the stone. The Bible says he hewn out the rock. The Bible says he did all of this stuff. But the reality is, is that he financed it. The Bible takes the point to tell us, and there's several reasons, two for sure that I can think of, but that he was rich. He was rich, and he was wealthy, and so he gets the credit. He paid for it. And so don't discredit those people who fund the work of God. The Holy Spirit looks at the great moving of people. And he says, all these products and people at the will and expense of Joseph. And he says, Joseph went. Joseph begged. Joseph took. Joseph wrapped. Joseph laid. Joseph had hewn. Joseph rolled a great stone and so on and so on. Because it was Joseph that was making it happen. It was Joseph who was setting the wheels in motion. It was Joseph's influence. Joseph's riches and all of this is done to perfectly fulfill what was said 400 years earlier or i'm sorry 700 years earlier in your notes isaiah 53 verse 9 and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth not only was he crucified between two wicked thieves but he was buried in the tomb of a rich man and everything just I mean, just to the pinpoint is fulfilled. It's wonderful. Here's your bullet point. Thirdly, he belonged to the council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L. And that is a counselor. He was an honorable counselor, the Bible says. His role as a counselor meant that he worked on the council. He was numbered among the seventy. Which is interesting, because the Bible says he still waited for the kingdom of God, and he believed that when a kingdom comes, it's going to have a king, which makes sense, and he believed that Jesus was the king of that kingdom, which, my friends, he certainly is, right? And he was trusting in Christ, and his humble submission to the Father, prepared him to stand against the apostasy and the Sanhedrin, which, as we have seen, was very corrupt, very apostate. But even within that apostasy, even within that apostate place, we find people who were believers. And I think for this reason, we would be wise to not write off everyone in groups that have great problems. We would be wise. 
Uh, I spoke to a man just two weeks ago, and he was telling me he was going to be preaching a sermon on DEI and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and this sort of all this woke kind of stuff that's going on. And he said, and boy, I'm going to let the Anglicans have it. He goes, they're all apostate. They're all undone. And I happen to know for a fact, like Christopher Ash and some other men in the Anglican church are not. They are Christian men and they believe the gospel and they're fighting for a little bit of sanity in that group. And it's like the group's a mess. The group's a mess. But there are some good people in that group kind of like Baptists. <laughs> the group's a mess. We're a mess. But God has his people. And a lot of times you'll see the people of God in places where it shocks you and they're fighting battles that you say, I, I wouldn't want to fight that battle. But they're there. They're doing that thing. They've been supernaturally empowered. They've been given that influence for such a time as this. And before we throw them under the bus, just to use modern vernacular, before we throw them under the bus, I think it would be wise to recognize before their own master they stand or fall. And I want to be careful. Now, if a man is apostate, I, I don't see any trouble with saying that. But a lot of times, you know, someone says there's no good people in politics. Well, be careful. There's no good people in this group. There's no good people in that group. I mean, you're okay to be a little skeptical. <laughs> but even in the Sanhedrin, there was Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night for fear of his compatriots. And there's Joseph who goes in boldly to Pilate and begs the body of Jesus like a beggar craving the body of Jesus boldly. These two ends of the spectrum, and there may have been more we don't know about, right? We just don't know. Inter anyways, number four. Fourthly, and most importantly for his own soul, he was a disciple. He was a disciple. Not one of the 12, not one of the 70, but he was a follower of Jesus. If evidently in the three and a half years Jesus had been ministering, Joseph had heard the good news that the king of the kingdom had arrived and he had trusted in Christ, began to follow him, and this is the one thing that makes the difference, right? Because you could be wealthy. You could be from an unknown place. You could be a religious person. But if you don't know Christ, if you don't know Christ, all of that's worthless. Here's your final bullet point. All the good choices Joseph made stem from the one needful choice to follow Jesus. And praise God, sometime during the ministry of Christ, he said, that's my king. And uh, that's wonderful. Fourthly, and lastly, we'll look at the rulers. This is verses 62 through 66. And Susanna, if you want to draw a picture, you could draw a picture of the religious rulers, the Jews, going to tell Pilate to put a stone over the tomb. Okay? No, he's the king. Okay? Good. Good. There's one more group that we read about that reacts to Christ's death. These are the chief priests and the Pharisees. They're the religious rulers of Israel. They approach Pilate, and it's interesting because they come the day after the preparation, and they're so fastidious about all of this stuff, but when it comes to the Passover, they go into Pilate. And it seems like from the text, and I can't say for certain I didn't put it in your notes because I couldn't be sure I didn't understand this point, but it does seem like they enter into Pilate's hall, whereas before, when Christ was being tried, they wouldn't come in. They stood outside, and Pilate had to go back and forth from his throne to them. And now it seems like they're coming into him on their Passover. They didn't want to get dirty on the preparation, but they're so desperate to squash this uh, work. What they would think is an aberration, but it's the work of God. And they say... And, and you just, oh, it's so slimy. They start with sir, and uh, I don't know how to do a verbal eye roll, or I would. They're giving this, you know, they, they have Pilate wrapped around their, their fingers, and they come in giving this false sort of honor. 
Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he's risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Now, we cannot fully know their motives at this point, but we can have a pretty good guess. Because after Jesus' resurrection, eyewitnesses come to them and say, he is alive, and they say, we will pay for you to not say that ever again. So it doesn't seem to me like they're really uh, worried about the disciples stealing the body. But I don't know their motivations at this instant. Here's your bullet point. What is very obvious is their blatant hatred of Jesus Christ. They won't even mention his name. They only call him the deceiver. The deceiver. We remember what that deceiver said while he was yet alive. John MacArthur points out this interesting fact. Your next bullet point. The chief priests were largely Sadducees and therefore were strong theological opponents of the Pharisees. So time out. Chief priests and Pharisees. Chief priests are mainly Sadducees. Okay, time in. The Gospels record only one other instance of those two groups being brought together. Matthew 21, verse 45, the scribes of, or chief priests of Pharisees. And in both instances, their only common motivation was hatred of Jesus. Only thing they had in common. And we must not assume that these men were believers. Um... We don't assume they were believers. Here's your bullet point. They were so firmly entrenched in their unbelief that when given facts from eyewitnesses, they refused to believe. And their condition was that they were dead in trespasses and sins. They were blind and deaf at heart. They were at enmity with God. But they knew what Jesus said and believed that the end error would be worse than the first error if the deceiver had his body stolen by his disciples. In effect, they're saying, could you imagine what an uproar there would be if people began to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead? They were calling him Christ, the one who comes in the name of the Lord only six days ago. Imagine what they would say if they believed that he was telling the truth. Imagine. And we mentioned this in lesson 168. The title was the second unjust trial of Jesus. Here's your bullet point. The Jews were playing politics and Pilate was really in no position to argue with them. They had him over a barrel, so to speak, because one more report to Tiberius from these rabble rousing Jews or one more hint of a revolution and his head was on the line. And interestingly enough, that's pretty much what happened. Although he escaped from Tiberias, he did not escape Caligula. It was 36 AD, and I've given you this quote from the Encyclopedia Britannica on Pilate. It says this, Pilate was ordered back to Rome to stand trial for cruelty and oppression, particularly on the charge that he had executed men without proper trial. And that sounds about right, doesn't it? According to Eusebius of Caesarea's ecclesiastical history, Pilate killed himself on orders from the emperor Caligula. Reminded me of Rommel, Samuel. Kind of a similar situation. And there, there's no escape. There's no escape. His job was to bring justice. That ship has sailed. And now whatever these people want, they get. And we don't know if he just feared the Jews. It's possible he was beginning to believe there was nothing he could do to stop <laughs> what was happening. He'd already been told how powerless he was the day before. He may finally be starting to believe it. I have people in my life who are very confident that uh, Pilate, will be in heaven. I don't share that confidence, but I have hope. 
I would like to think that God allows us to be humbled and to come to the end of our limits to find the beginning of God's strength. I do sense the desperation in his voice where he says in verse 65, Ye have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as ye can. It's almost like he's saying, do the best you can. Try. You know, do what you think you can do to stop this. And uh, I do sense some resignation there. So I'm hopeful. But I can't say. I don't think Scripture gives us any clarity on that. But they went and they made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. And this is wonderful. Here's your bullet point. The rulers wanted to prevent anything harmful to their kingdom. But God was even over this. Consider how easy it would have been for God to prevent them from setting soldiers. How easy it would have been for God to slow them from setting a watch. How easy it would have been for God to stop them from rolling the stone over the tomb and sealing it tight. God could have stopped all of that. But do you know what it would have done? It would have lent credence to the lie that the disciples stole the body. What the Jews don't realize they're doing is they are setting up a situation where only a supernatural miracle could bring this body out of the tomb. At this point, it cannot be stolen by people. It cannot be stolen by the disciples or by the women. It cannot be stolen by these unarmed uh, rabble rousers. It cannot be stolen. There's no way they are getting a corpse out of that tomb. Only a supernatural miracle will get the body out of the tomb. They meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Here's your bullet point. The Lord allowed these fools to make it as sure as they can and give unassailable evidence of the supernatural resurrection of Jesus, which they did. They made it as sure as they could. But would you like some good news? They couldn't keep the body in the tomb. I know it's spoiler alert for Sunday. <laughs> I'm spoiling it a little bit. Here's your bullet point. Heaven and earth combine their powers to keep Jesus in the grave, but Christ is greater. There is no power in heaven, on earth, or under the earth that can even hold a candle to the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is greater. When it was time to rise up, nothing could stop him. And we'll finish this with a kind of an odd phrase, but it's from Jethro. It's from Moses' father-in-law, and I thought it was fitting. Exodus 18, verse 11. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. He was above them. And we see their pride, but we see in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, God was above them. And now the body's in the tomb. It's sealed away. What do we do? We wait for Sunday. Sunday's coming. Let's bow for prayer. Father, bless us. We thank you for the rejoicing we have in Jesus Christ, and we ask that you would draw us back here Sunday to worship you, to renew our joy in you, to renew our hope, our confidence, our faith, in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for him. And we ask that you bless us now as we go. Bring us back on the Lord's day in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you, my friends. You are dismissed. Lord willing, we'll see you Easter morning.